Hello, my name is Adam Novak and we'll now have a quick look at the Generate Modifiers in Blender. I've split this lecture over two lessons because there's so much to cover and I'm only going to cover the basic forms. Every one of these modifiers can probably have a 10 to 40 minute lesson on each of them at minimum. So I'll just do my best to cover it and give you a basic understanding. So let's have a look at the modifiers. The modifiers and generate modifiers do not change an object data unless you click apply. Now with many of these generate modifiers, you have to be very careful of rotation or transformations of the origin or the object we are trying to do the generations to because the rays, screws and mirror modifiers, the axes in which we're trying to do the generations to will be relative to the object transformations. So if we have transformed an object by 90 degrees as we have in this example here, the transformations to the object will also have the transformations as we do it to the generate modifiers. There's also a very clear order of precedence so that the first modifier in the list on the top will be done first as you go down the list that will be added to the object, modifying it as we go along. And there's another thing that's not many people are aware of, especially with subdivision modifiers, when you do a subdivision surface modifier, it's actually quicker to have the modifier still there without applying it. Calculating individual vertices and faces takes a lot longer for Blender than to create the modifiers and calculate it from the modifiers. So we're going to look at the precedence here. On the left, we simply got the bevel modifier first and then the subsurface modifier, as opposed to on the right, we've got the subsurface modifier first and then the bevel modifier. As you can see, there's a very clear difference in how the mesh is displayed and it's up to you how you want the results. Another very handy thing is you can simply push Control L if you've got two objects selected and you can copy one set of modifiers from one object to another. Having the object on the right selected last or being the active object, we are now going to copy, pushing Control L, the modifiers to the object on the left. So it now has a subsurface modifier before the bevel, as opposed to how it had the order of operations before. Arrays are very important, and that's probably something that I use most often in terms of the generate modifiers, other than subsurface. Um, all array modifiers array constantly. The difference between the relative and the constant modifier is the relative array will array constantly relative to the object size. So in this case here, we've got two blender units as the object size. The object will array as two blender units each time. If we go down here to the second object, we have got an array of just less than two blender units as its size because we have rotated and its X axis, which we are arraying on, is no longer two blender units. So the actual transformation of the array does not traverse as far distance as it would if it was arraying on its furthest point. Another thing to remember is that it's arraying along a relative axis. So if we did rotate the object itself, it would array along another axis. In this case here, we have selected the array to be one on the top axis and down the bottom here, we've selected two along the X axis. This simply means that we are arraying by a relative factor of two for the object size. So if we have a look here, we've got a space of exactly one whole empty object between it because we have doubled the space of the array which we are arraying. Constant arrays are constantly arrayed as the previous one. The only difference between this one and the previous one is the constant arrays use blender units to calculate its array as opposed to the actual object size itself. So in this case, we are still arraying along the X axis, except for we are offsetting by blender units. At the top here, we have one blender unit, as you can see along the grid. And in the middle here, we are arraying by two blender units. And down the bottom here, we've actually added a scale to the object. So we have to remember there has been some transformations in the bottom instance to the object itself. We can push control A to apply the scale, or we can just leave the constant array and be aware of it and change the input to the value here. It's up to you what you are dealing with at the current time and what's most important, your results quite. This is the sort of thing you simply need to just spend time in and it will become more clear with time. Arrays are very important, especially when transforming to an object. So when transforming arrays, we've got the option of rotating the object itself as we have done on the right here. We have physically rotated the object so that it now is transversing along the Y axis. We have turned on the local gimbal option so we can see the Y 
axis is traveling to the left and the X axis is upwards on our screen. So we have this on the right, still arrayed along the X axis, except we have rotated the object 90 degrees along its Z axis. So it's now rotated 90 degrees, traversing along a different axis. On the left here, we have got the same result simply by putting the relative offset to one into its Y axis rather than its X axis. The bevel modifier is very useful. It's something that's done to any hard surface objects when rendering to give it a realistic look. Solid 90 degree or solid angles on the edges is not something that's really experienced in real life and having at least a very small bevel will make it look realer. The bevel calculations are done by edges, although as you can see in a second, we do have the option to click only the vertices. And we can turn on the bevel to be on the vertices only. This has some very neat and useful looking functions, though it's something I do not do personally myself very often. Generally when I use bevel, I use it to increase the geometry or the segments along the edges. So as you can see on the left here, we've got one segment, then two, then three, and it's increasing geometry and giving us a nice smooth edge. We can also manipulate the bevel options by changing the angle in which we want the object edges to bevel. So for example, in this case here, we've got 40 degrees in. What we have told Blender we want it to do is only bevel edges where it changes in direction by more than 40 degrees. So as we can see here, this edge loop here changes by 60 degrees. So we have beveled this edge loop. If we look at this edge loop here, this is only a 15 degree edge loop as we traverse this edge. So this edge itself is not beveled, traverses 30 degrees because it's on both axes. So it does not reach the 40 degrees and it does not bevel the edge. This is useful for often keeping rendering time or processing time down. So you're only beveling edges which require it and edges which only have a very slight difference in angle might not require the bevel to add the extra geometry. The other option is to bevel edges by weight and this gives you manual input, push, control and E and this will give you the option to increase or decrease the bevel by weight, um, zero being none and one being full. The other useful one that I really enjoy is being able to change it between concave and convex. We can do this simply by changing the profile value, minimum being 0.15 and maximum being one, 0 0.5 being standard. The Boolean operations are something that I think I would use more than most people in a 3D environment simply because I come from a 3D printing business. So a lot of my prototyping is adding objects and changing and altering quite often after I've actually made it of design. They want something changed. So I often have to use Boolean operations. Though I will now say I hate using Boolean operations unless I have to. It gives you very ugly geometry. You can no longer edit ring loops. You often get doubles and you get some strange triangles. And I do not like faces above four or five vertices unless I specifically put them there myself. And I know why there's a pinch point. So if we just look at some of the Boolean operations, two examples, we've got a cube and a plane. They operate on volume. So they're able to add, subtract or change one mesh by another by its current volume. You can subtract by volume, add by volume, or make the difference by the volume. Another thing you've got to know about the boarding operation, they only work on faces, not edges. So unless you have manifold and clean faces, it probably won't give you clean results. And by saying that, I recommend always before using Boolean operations, check for double vertices, push W in edit mode when all vertices are selected and remove doubles and see if you have any double vertices. You also have to do it after using the Boolean operations because it often creates doubles. So if you want to make editing or changing the mesh easier, remove the doubles as soon as possible. It might make your life easier. The other thing I can recommend is make an appropriate polygon count. You sometimes have to subsurface or add ring segments to the appropriate part of your mesh where it's actually near contact. And by putting extra polygons or ring segments where appropriate, you're helping Blender make the calculations and it often gives you much cleaner results. The last one I probably should suggest is that normal direction plays a very, very big role in Boolean operations. If you are finding that you're getting exact opposite to what you expect, it might be because your faces are facing the wrong direction. And that might mean, though it looks correct, your scale might be inverted. You might have to push Control A, apply the scale, 
and then flip normal directions to get proper results on the boolean operation. And we can push control and end together to flip the normals of the mesh if we need to. Here's a quick look at some of the properties of the boolean operations before we get into the individual ones. I'll quickly mention the carve because carve is actually something I'm not personally too familiar with. It's only been released with Blender as a standard quite recently. According to the Wikipedia on Blender, it is simply a faster and superior version of the Boolean operations as they have been used in the past. It's just better and to be honest I've been using it recently and I haven't found a situation where it hasn't worked for me yet. So I've really enjoyed it. And if we're going to have a quick look at the threshold in the case of the B mesh modifier, and this allows you to set a distance of the calculation between the meshes in which the overlay of the vertices are starting to be calculated. I do not change this myself very often. Having the smallest number possible is often best. So that's why I've now converted to the carve method. So if we have a look at the intersect method, all the intersect does is creates a mesh at the internal volume. So we looked at the left here where we got the cube itself selected and we've got the intersect modifier being applied to the operator being the plane. If we clicked apply, we're going to get volume. So because there is no volume in this case for the object of the operator, we are simply getting the plane version of it and the point of intersect or contact. On the right here though, however, I've given the plane some volume we are actually removing all the volume except for the points at where it intersects. So we get the remaining volume of the mesh being the cube at the point of intersection. In the case of the Boolean difference, you are able to subtract by volume. I often use this for putting holes into prototypes or designs. So a clip has a fitting that needs to pass through it. I need to cut out a circle from the clip for a prototype, for a customer, I'm able to use a difference and cut a circle from an object which I've already created because they were not aware themselves they need it in place. The other most common one is simply Boolean union. It's simply jointed two objects together. The object data does remain of the operator, so you may need to delete that after the fact. Also, in all cases of Boolean operations, I'll say this again, try to remove doubles after or before the fact if you're having bad results and check normal directions. The build modifier is a bit more fun, it's an animation. You've got the option to select at what frame it starts at. In this case, we're starting at frame one, standard. We can change the start frame to 51 if we'd like. We can also change the length to 150. There'll be an example in this video in just a moment. We can also reverse the animation. So rather than build, we're actually destroying the object we created. The other option is to randomize the order in which the faces are created. So it no longer builds the faces or destroys them in the order that the faces were created in the model. It simply randomizes it. If you're unhappy with the randomized factor, you can change the seed and you'll get a different random. So we have a quick look at all the different types of build modifiers as they are displayed here. We can see the build standard of a UV sphere. If we start it later or change the length, they both finish later. We've also tried a reversed modifier, so we've reversed it, destroying instead of building, so it's no longer there after the fact, rather than starting there. We've got two more options, randomizing it, so you can see there's a random creation of faces. And on the very bottom right here, we've changed the precedence. I've added subsurface modifier first, so you can see how the precedence might change the order of operation. The decimate option is quite a different one and it's something I've used when I've had large grids being manipulated by a texture and I've needed to make a smaller polygon version after the fact or I've done organic sculpting using dynamic topology and I've needed to decimate it. By decimating it we're actually triangulating the faces and if we've got a factor of decimate as 0 0.05 you can actually see that we've actually halved the amount of polygons and if we see again, if we decimated by a factor of 0.1, we've actually reduced the amount of polygons by up to 110 almost, and we've only got 795 polygons after we have decimated the object. To apply it, we can click apply, and then we will get the triangle form, which can be very ugly and hard to work with. We can push Control J though to try and put it back to squares. And this might help us, though the calculations can be ugly depending on where it starts. 
The other option in the generate modifier is the edge split. It's not something I am too familiar with using or use often at all, but I'll let you know how it works. You can split edges by an angle selected. So if I've got the angle selected at 30 here, this edge and this edge here will be split while this one remains because this only has 20 degrees. This is 40, which is clearly above 30 and so is 60. All non-manifold edges are split. That means edges which share three or more faces. Also got the option to split edges that are made sharp. So we can alt right click and ring loop, make it sharp by pushing control E, and then we can split those edges if we'd like using this modifier. Another very useful modifier I didn't actually notice was so useful until quite recently is the mask modifier. I always had trouble hiding vertices and exiting edit mode and the vertices would reappear and it was hard to edit the mesh inside of it. And my only other option was to move the whole object, hide it or position it in another layer. By masking an object we can actually get access to inside the object without changing its mesh data. And this could be temporary or permanent depending on how we see fit for the time. The most common one is by vertex group. One being visible and zero being invisible. We will go through vertex groups more in the future, just letting you know that the values are there and this is how it operates. The way armatures work, armatures always have vertexes associated with it. So there's a vertex group associated with the armature already. So that armature manipulates that vertex group. If we wanted to, we can select a specific armature and hide the vertex group that armature is manipulating. Personally, I have not used this one yet. I have used the vertex groups manually. I like manual manipulation coming from hard surface modeling, though this is very useful. The last modifier we'll talk about is simply the mirror modifier. This is probably the most common one you will ever use other than subsurface modifier. Do use it whenever you can. Make work as easy as possible. Don't do it twice, do it once and copy it. There's no point doing it twice, don't reinvent the wheel. If we had a look at the example at the top left here, we've got one eighth of a torus. I've deleted the rest. And if we mirrored it on its X axis, you can see we've now got one quarter of a torus. We simply mirrored it and we're almost there. At the top right here, we've got one half a torus. And all I've done in this case is mirrored it instead on its Y and Z axis. So we've now got a half a full torus. The only axis that has not been mirrored is the X axis in this case. Down the bottom left here, we've got a full torus with all of the axes being mirrored. And down the bottom right here, we've got one quarter of torus, but this time we're going to mirror it around another object. When we mirror one object around another object, what we have to remember is that it's using the operator's origin to mirror. So because this is an empty in this case, its object origin is right in its center, and we're mirroring on the X axis right along the center line here. So when mirroring any object, just remember that it mirrors the object along its origin unless we have set an object to be mirrored along. After mirroring, we often have to merge double vertices or we can simply click the merge option here and this is the merge limit in Blender units that it will merge double vertices. So if any two vertices are within the limit shown here, they will be destroyed and reduced to single vertices. Another really cool thing about the mirror option is UV unwrapping can be very, very difficult. But unwrapping one eighth of a sphere can be very easy relatively. If we unwrap one eighth of a sphere, we can unwrap only a part of an object, do the UV wrapping and then put the texture onto it. And then by adding the mirror modifier, we're actually able to get a much easier unwrapping. And I think this is actually something that a lot of people miss out. Unwrapping using UV when possible and mirror modifying it can be amazingly helpful. Thank you for watching and as always, please subscribe or support us on Patreon.